Thank you and good morning. You'd think with that introduction that uh, I'd be somebody that would have a very strong plan for my life, but one of the worst questions you can ever be asked by an audience is, where are you going to be in 10 years' time? I have absolutely no idea where I'm going to be in 10 years' time, and the reason for that is because good things sometimes just seem to happen. Um, and I may even just get my first slide happening. Uh, right, okay, now let's skip back to the first slide. Uh, my website is my name. So if you want to ask me a gardening question at some stage, just remember my name and you can email me through my website. Uh, my house and garden is, is basically what I'm now famous for. I've become that guy that grows vegetables in Wynnum. But there's a, a lot of other things that I do in, in, in my life. Um, this, this probably is one of the, the most important things to say when I'm talking about living sustainably. What does sustainably actually mean? There's a, there's a lovely series of political posters from Vietnam, and I've got a selection of them to show you here, um, because they have a really serious attitude towards home food production. And my idea of sustainability is, is more than just growing food, it's about recognising the fact that you're not independent. The worst thing you can be when you try to live sustainably is self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is the ultimate in selfishness, where you wall yourself off away from your friends and neighbours and society and make sure that you're okay and it doesn't matter what happens to other people. Sustainable living is about recognising dependence on other people. I don't prepare my own clothes, I don't pr produce my own uh, cameras or all sorts of different things. I depend on other people to provide those services for me, but the key things the most important things for sustainable living that I deal with are power, food, water, and population. Now, you heard um, people with one of the earlier speakers are talking about relationships and um, the various complexities you can find yourself in. I've had five relationships, and they've all ended perfectly at just the right time, and no <laughs> lawyers were needed. Um, you know, sometimes good things happen. In the same way, we heard about being athletic and, you know, all the sort of work you can do. Well, that's my energy production, and that's why I use... Well, my gym is my garden. And this is another political post. Plant vegetables around the home, keep chickens in the yard. Very simple messages. But, you know, when it comes to living sustainably, it doesn't mean to say you have to have one of everything. I don't have any chickens but I'm never without eggs. And the reason is I always have a surplus of jam and bananas and seed and all sorts of other... Oh, we've got sound again. There we go. Sometimes good things happen. Um, or not. Um, where was I? I don't have chickens, but I'm never without eggs. And that's because I barter. And in the same way that not everybody needs to have a lawnmower uh, duplicating things over and over again. If you've got friends and neighbours that can help, you can share things. I don't have a trailer. My neighbour has a trailer. I do a deal with him if I need to go to the tip and we organise our pruning days together. That's how sustainable living works, OK? So it's, it's a very simple thing, remembering the source of the water you drink. Well, the water I drink comes off my roof. And then I process all the wastewater on my property with a sewage system, and I, that's all processed, it's disinfected, it's sterilised, and then that extra water goes back into the garden. And so I use my source of wastewater as a source of fertiliser, and I'm the only person in Queensland that actually uses wastewater to grow food. So it's quite, it can be quite exciting. And using that nourishment to grow food means I reduce my fertiliser bill. Um, by having that sort of system with my own sewage system at home, all of you could come along and you could use my facilities, you could dual flush all day long. The system keeps returning the water, so we use no water at all, but I get to keep your nutrients. And that means 
<laughs> I'm able to reduce my fertiliser bill and I grow food, which reduces my shopping bill. And there's all sorts of little things that go on that you never see. And I never talk about on Gardening Australia because um, my reality is, is actually very boring and very simple. You know, there's a, that's my house. That house produces three times as much electricity as it uses. So I'm, I'm putting electricity into the grid. My, my electricity bill is very, very low. Um, I'm almost self-sufficient in water. And the way I grow food, I use about a 15th of the water that a farmer would use to grow the same amount of food. I am essentially very thrifty. That's one of the reasons my place won an award. Um, but it's also a very simple place to live. You know, when you go past it, you wouldn't think there's all sorts of little things going on there. And one of the things that goes on there that's not exciting to many people is the trading. I do a lot of work which involves an economic activity, but there's no cash transferring hands. Just recently, I had one and a half hours of radio programs edited for me for free, well, in return for two trays of marmalade. Um, so, you know, you can get all sorts of goods and services without using hard cash. This is my reality of thrifty living. And the, also, the landscape reality I've got there is I've extended my garden onto the nature strip. So I've got sweet potato on one side, aloe vera on the other. So that's a, a, a med medicinal plant. And I chose the aloe vera very carefully. It's non-spiny. Um, the idea is that you get kids running up and down playing games in the streets. And so if somebody is skateboarding along and they go flat down in the aloe vera, the worst thing that's going to happen to them is they're going to get heavily moisturised. Um, <laughs> on the left-hand side, I've got a really rare palm, and that's a signature thing. You know, there's no point being Jerry and, unless you have some rare plants, but that provides palm fruit, palm nuts like miniature coconuts, and shade and shelter and it's a lovely landscape element. And that's the way I try and work. I try and make sure that every plant that I grow has more than one function. It's not just food, it's not just ornament, it conforms to a whole range of different things. And unless you're really into gardening, you're probably just gonna drive straight past that place and all you'll see is solar panels on the roof. Sustainable living is, is really very simple when you have these things and this is what it looks like on the other side of the house. I've got them on both sides. I've got quite a nice little power system. The wastewater system sits underneath the house quite demurely. To get permission to have this sewage system, Brisbane City Council had to bend the laws. And it's illegal to have this in a sewered suburb, so when people come and visit me, like last weekend when I had my open day, um, people visit 813 square metres of rural Wynnum, because it's okay to have these in the countryside. So I'm a little slice of countryside in the middle of the city. Um, this is my, my little plan. There's one little note there that I made in 2006 where I was encouraging people to prepare for less certain economic times, and this is well before the GFC. But the significance of that little, that little planting of fruit trees is, is quite important. I know most of you are seniors, which means you probably own your own homes already. But if you know somebody that's having problems paying their mortgage, consider planting a fruit tree. Now, I've got a lime tree, Tahitian lime tree, which is just about 12 years old, and it occupies slightly less space than the stage I'm standing on. And it produced, three years ago, it started producing serious food. I got six crops that first year. I bottled all the marmalade, and I sold it at an open day, and the profits paid my mortgage for six weeks of the year. Now, look, I'm not encouraging everybody to do exactly what I've done and because you know what it's like when lemons are fruiting, you can't give them away. They're not good currency either for hard cash or for bartering. Tahitian limes are slightly different. They have a better resale value and the products you get for them have more value. So they're more useful in my home economy. So if you're encouraging somebody to plant a fruit tree, encourage them to plant something which is slightly different and to think about what products they can make from it because as fruit trees grow and thrive, they produce more and more fruit. Um, so that's, that's one example. But when you look at the garden, look, it's, it's really dead simple. There's nothing special about this garden. Um, there's the ornamental front garden, which you've seen there. 
Um, I've got a nursery at the top where I grow seedlings and plants, cuttings, things that I sell at my open day. At the south side of the house, lovely and warm and tropical, bananas, cocoa, yams, things that like it lush, sheltered, moist and warm. And on this side, I've got eight vegetable beds. I've got a lawn, and around the outside, I've got um, around the outside, I've got a perimeter of fruit trees. So it's all very simple: eight vegetable beds, crop rotation, pretty standard. Um, I spend about 12 to 14 hours a week gardening to produce food, because that's my sanity. Some people will go and see a psychiatrist. I go and see the vegetable garden, you know. Um, I mean, this, the, the very first speaker was talking about exercise and all that sort of thing. Well, that's my exercise. That's my gym. Um, I, I could not stand going to a formal gym. The idea of all those sweaty armpits makes shifting a ton of buffalo manure look really appealing, you know. <laughs> This is the thing, you've got to personalise your lifestyle and for me, gardening is my therapy. And I was just talking earlier, before I went, went on stage, when I used to run Sydney Botanic Gardens, you know, you'd think, lovely place to work, people always used to say, oh, it must be lovely working with the flowers, but it was the public service. And sometimes a whole week would go by and you'd achieve absolutely nothing. So I could go home, I could mow the lawn, edge it, and there I'd achieve something. It made me feel good. And feeling good is one of the major reasons why I enjoy gardening. You know, and that question about where are you going to be in 10 years' time, I have no idea. I do not have a plan. My plan is to enjoy gardening as much as I can. I've only got 813 square metres of Australia. But because I manage that organically, that sequesters atmospheric CO2. It's part of climate repair. And that small plot of land, because it's maintained organically, soaks up enough CO2 that I could actually get on a plane and fly from Brisbane to Sydney and back twice every year, and I'm not adding CO2 to our atmosphere. That's how powerful 813 square metres of land can be. That 800 square meter, 813 square metres soaks up a minimum of a million litres of water in an average year. During the flood years of 11, 12 and 13, it soaked up every single drop. I didn't add any to the stormwater. When we look at things like the Great Barrier Reef, suffering from pollution runoff, siltation, um, pesticides, I've just done a little bit of simple landscaping on that plot and all the nutrients stay on that site. Now, when I showed you that slide of my front garden, which I said looked very ordinary, those little fluffy things that were right in the centre, they're banksias. Banksias are really intolerant of phosphorus in the soil. They're at the lowest point of my property. So if any phosphorus escapes my garden, and my objective as a gardener is to have nutrient-rich soil in which to grow healthy food to feed me, none of that phosphorus leached out, not even in the flood years. Those banksias are still going. They are my warnings if nutrients exit. Now, all of those things I do in my garden, any farmer can do. So we actually have a plan for repairing the Great Barrier Reef if we can get governments and farmers on side. Now, there's some serious stuff, and the most important thing about climate change is it's happening far faster than the CSIRO predicted. They said in 2003 how our climate would be by 2050. Now they said in 2013 that they had got it right, but the climate changes had occurred 20 years earlier than they believed possible. So we're not talking about doing things for our grandchildren or our children, we're talking about doing things for us now. And they said back in 2013, our climate has changed for good. That's it. So what do you do? Do you get down in the dumps about it or do you get interested and engaged in what's going on? And my response is to get interested and engaged. South Eastern Queensland has the most fickle weather of any place I've gardened on earth. And if that's the case, then think of everything as being an experiment. Don't go for rigid plans, you know, you only sow your, your sweet peas. Um, in March, you know, on, on St. Patrick's Day. Don't think that way. If it's warm and sweet peas like cool weather, wait a bit, you know. Or if the weather's extremely warm as it has been just recently, 
Don't wait until next spring to sow some snake beans. Sow them now. It's an experiment. All life on earth is an experiment. And when you do that, things suddenly become much more fun. And you become much more informed as a gardener. And that idea of experimenting was my grandmother's idea. And she said to me, never be scared to experiment. Observe what happens and keep a record. Basic scientific method. And anybody can do it. And this is the fun about gardening because anybody can do it. Now, when it comes to things like this, um, we all know that this particular pesticide is the world's favourite systemic poison. We also know that by using it, it's causing mass B diet, uh, deaths, colony collapse disorder, and it is now causing deaths of birds that feed caterpillars to their babies when the caterpillars have got that poison in them. In Britain, it is the major cause of birds dying. Now, if you go to my website, you can see how to make your own systemic pesticide, nicotine soap. There is a use for nicotine soap in the garden. And it's my grandfather's recipe which is there. And it's there purely for your entertainment because, of course, it is illegal to make your own pesticides without getting them registered by the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. So it's just there for your entertainment. But, you know... <laughs> Just see how Grandad used to do it. When I was a garden centre manager, the last thing I wanted was to sell plants that had holes in their leaves because I'd have to mark them down. That means I make less money. And that may mean that I might have to lay off a member of staff. So, of course, I use pesticides as a garden centre manager and I use nicotine soap because it breaks down within 21 days of use and we know it is perfectly safe. We know it, we understand it, it works and if you go to my website, you can see a little bit of gardening history. But of course, don't do it at home, because that would be illegal, and it would be very bad of me to tell you that. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've also experienced in Wynnum, Wynnum's a horrible place to keep honeybees. Um, I was warned it was a bad place to keep honeybees because of diseases, and I thought, well, look, I'll give it a go. I'm here to learn something, so I tried keeping honeybees, and the first set of bees died with American fowl brood disease, which is a notifiable disease, so you have to tell DPI, you have to kill the bees, burn the contents of the boxes, irradiate the boxes at Narangba, and wait a year for another chance. So I did it. Lightning never strikes twice. Um, I didn't get American fowl brood disease again. The next time I got European fowl brood disease, <laughs> which is not notifiable, but you've still got to kill the bees, burn the contents, and then irradiate the boxes and wait another year. Well, I thought, well, you know, you're here to experience gardening in the subtropics, so I did it a third time. And uh, I had to go away for a conference during the drought. And when I came back, my housemates hadn't topped up the bee bath, so the bees had gone far and wide to get water. And when I came back home, a um, small hive beetle had got in there, wax moth had followed them, the brood was ruined, so I had to kill the bees get rid of the contents of the boxes, and I thought, bugger it, I'm going to go native. And I started practicing um, and rehearsing different types of plants that you could grow, things like coriander and Italian flat-leaf parsley, two really important things to have flowering in your garden. And because I have a succession of flowers in my garden all year round, I now have 23 species of native bee visiting my garden and they pollinate absolutely everything that I grow in the absence of honeybees. So I have a small scale version for gardening beyond the honeybee. And the good news about this was when I interviewed the Australian National University, um, Professor David Lindemeyer confirmed that you can do just what I'm doing on my little domestic scale. You can roll it out on an industrial scale on any farm, whether they're organic or not. It is possible to do it. So there is hope beyond bees as well. And you can see now why I'm starting to get excited. I'm, I'm a little bit more animated, but this is how gardening hooks people in because it's not just about vegetables. There's a lot more to it than vegetables, and we've explained already how something that I've done on a local scale, which uses simple technology, mulching, composts, organic fertilisers, soil improvement, contouring, all those sorts of things can be applied at a landscape level, and they can help save the Great Barrier Reef. So I've got plenty of hope and optimism. 
This is a little summary of some of the other experiences I've had while I've been feeding myself. Um, one thing I set out to prove was how powerful 100 square metres of good soil can be. And I can provide 70% of my needs from 100 square metres of soil even during unprecedented drought and using a 15th of the water that a farmer would use. Um, that is interesting, but I've also learned that you have to keep a certain amount of stored water to keep that soil productive. And I've worked out that you can scrape by at 7,000 litres of water per 100 square metres, and if you want to do it slightly more elegantly, 10,000 litres of stored water per 100 square metres. It works. But I get away with less than one litre of recycled sewage water per square metre a day, which is very thrifty. My front garden is ornamental. I started off with 150 different plants. I've now got about 118. They get watered six times before they go into the ground, and then they are abandoned to nature. That is the idea of preparing for climate change in an ornamental garden situation. You choose a reasonably appropriate plant, put it in a reasonably suitable position, introduce it to the garden gently by watering it six times, and then you sit back and see what happens. And I have to say, it's really easy to grow ornamental plants. So that was a simple thing. Uh, my rainwater tank, I've found ways of extending the use of the water that I have. But, you know, it's absorbing the water is the key thing. Because as our climate changes, if you've got compost-rich soil that's well-maintained, dug every now and then, it soaks up heaps of water. And th that was one of the joys of my garden during those flood years, of seeing that I lost no water. And this is a sort of reality of gardening in a continually surprising climate. The green is that reassuring little curve of the wet summers and the dry winters. That's the 50-year average for where I live, Brisbane Air near Brisbane Airport. That yellow line, the, particularly the big one on the right-hand side, that's the reality of rainfall. So you can see it can become very, very spotty. That really super wet December was three mornings, one after each other, and that was the entire summer's rain for me in Wynnum. So having a rainwater tank and water absorbent soil is really important for coping. Um, so rainwater tanks are part of the solution. Some of the food I grow, is interesting and slightly outside of the norm, but winged yams. I can grow up to 172 kilos of yams in 10 square metres, so a garden bed roughly the size of this stage. That's serious food, and I can stick it underneath the house. You don't have to free, freeze it, refrigerate it, or keep it shaded from the light like you do with potatoes. Serious stuff. And you put on weight if you eat lots of yams too. You know, it's, it's solid, sustaining starch. But this is the fun. You know, the idea for me is exploring the world in which I live. So I've explored the world of bees. 23 bees pollinate my crops. I'm able to garden without worrying about runoff, without losing nutrients, without losing silt. I'm able to grow a surplus of food with which to trade. And for the last two years, I've been able to live in a household of three with being the only breadwinner in that group. It is ultimately very, very thrifty. And the way I've done it is by offsetting costs. Reducing the cost of electricity is one of them. Reducing the cost of buying fresh food is another one. But also having this surplus of food that I can grow in my garden is also an important element in what I do. Um, I've only got a couple of minutes before I, I wind up, but look, pigeon peas, everybody's eaten split peas at one stage, and you usually have them in soups or maybe in a dal. Um, but I can grow three times the yield in my garden that the average farmer can grow. So I, I, I can be seriously productive. I've discovered new species of insect that have added to the inventory of Australia's biodiversity. And so that in itself is something anybody can do. All I did to discover that new species was say, oh, I don't know what it is, take some photos, and then I've asked an expert to identify it, and they've said, well, we know it's this particular genus, but we don't know what the species is. Now, I'll be dead before anybody gives it a proper name, because not many people study wasps. But, you know, 
it's really exciting when you see this particular thing. I know it's just sitting there quietly, but this is a parasite. And this parasite parasitizes the parasites that parasitize the pests in my garden. Okay, so I've got this uber parasite living quite happily amongst the goldenrod in my garden, managing the creatures that manage the pests in my garden that stop me from needing to f use pesticides to crawl, control them. This is a part of integrated pest control I never expected that I would see. And um, living in my sweet potato on the right hand side is a rare insect. This little thing has only been discovered from six places in Australia. My nature strip sweet potato is providing critical habitat for a species of scientific interest. Now, as I mentioned, I've got 300 square metres of food garden. This year, at my open day, if you'd have come along to my open day, you'd have seen that I have a 129 different things on my menu. Now, that is much more easy to manage than you think, but 129 things, I think I've probably got my bases covered when it comes to nutrition. You know, stir fries, curries, soups, stews, salads, all those sorts of things are very accepting of diversity. And if you have a little bit of everything, you know, then you never get really bored. And even if you do have a surplus of yams, it's amazing how many different herbs you can use to change the flavour and make it more appealing. So 129 things on my menu at the moment. Um, at my open day, I had 875 jars of surplus jam to sell. So I've actually beaten my six-week mortgage lifter. Um, <laughs> I had 26 different types of seed, 911 packets of seed on sale. And I had 1,800 spare plants, seed cuttings and division, which I was able to sell all from 300 square metres of soil, all of which helps to keep me fed, helps me live on a very small salary compared to what you normally think a person on TV would earn. Um, and it has allowed me to remain sane without having to pay a psychologist. Um, I don't have to go to a gym. And as far as I know, I still have the stamina to garden and I can garden people that are half my age for far longer than they can keep going. You know, so all those things said, I think gardening is definitely an option for anybody and it can start at any time. With me, this whole journey started with a packet of radish, a packet of lettuce and a packet of spring onion seed and I just scattered it on the ground Six to eight le weeks later, we had a salad. My family were patting me on the back and I thought, oh, I can do this, I can be a gardener. And so can you. Thanks very much.